All right, thank you, worship team. Hey, open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to invite a couple friends to come on up. Yeah. All right, you get to use the pink mic today. And I'm going to ask Kat to go first, actually. Yeah, right on. Hey, uh, uh, just also in your bulletin, I wanted to point out that our deacons were confirmed by a congregational vote uh, two weeks ago, as well as Jamie Allen as our, uh, as our newest elder. So just uh, thank the Lord for those servants. And uh, you can see their names there. So, hey guys, thanks for coming and helping me out. You uh, went to an event called Urbana uh, a couple months ago. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. We got some pictures that uh, you can see there. Uh, Kat, tell us, tell us who was with you guys uh, at Urbana. Yeah, so it was me. Is this working? Hello? Yeah, it's, it's oh, okay. It's me, uh, Dan Howe, and his twin brother, Caleb, and their sister, Jen, uh, Helena, our friend, Audrey, uh, Caroline, Aaron Gates, um, uh, some people from Neighborhood Bible Church, uh, and yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. That's about it. Thanks. All right. So, uh, my name is Kat. And for me, Urbana 2018 was such an amazing experience, and I'm so thankful and blessed to have been able to go. Uh, At first, I actually wasn't planning on going until my friend Helena uh, asked me to keep an open mind about it, and I'm so happy that she did. Uh, I think one of my favorite parts about Urbana was the debrief session at the end of the day. Um, After, you know, all the morning Bible studies, the worship, Uh, prayer, listening to speakers, uh, and meeting with all those different missions organizations. It was coming back together and uh, talking with my friends about what they had learned and and how we were going to apply that to uh, our future. Um, We weren't always together the entire time, so it was nice to see if I had processed something differently or if I had actually missed something and, and see how they uh, process that information. Um, it was good to come into a debrief with my, my friends. And at the end, uh, we would just pray together. And it became really a, a personal and close experience. Uh, I felt genuinely their love for me and their love for each other and the love for God. Uh, that they had, and I could see God's light pouring out through them. Um, We had a lot of good crying sessions in those moments, and those were also some of my favorite ones, because you know they're most genuine. Um, (laughs) And I realized how, uh, how we were really building those close bonds with one another just over a week, and I really craved those close moments. Uh, I was you know, practicing them the least here at Valley, and I knew I needed them the most. Um, I'm usually a shy and quiet person. I don't like to ask questions or give interpretations during Bible study, Um, but after Urbana, I realized that I need to be more open to speaking with my community and those around me um, to get out the good word about Christ and his love for all of us. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Daniel, tell us about some of those crying sessions. How were those for you? Man, yes. Yeah, special. I was weeping. Yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, my name's Daniel. Um, I'm part of the, the Condi clan. Um, and um, you probably see there some of the pictures up on the wall back there. But, yeah, I grew up in Pakistan um, as a missionary kid. And it was cool going to Urbana and just meeting up with other missionary kids there. Um, There was a a missionary kid lounge where you could just um, meet other missionary kids, see where they're from, talk to them, um, eat food from like all over the world. I think there was fried bananas or something. That was was pretty good. Um, But yeah, it was just cool. And also the highlight of my trip was probably meeting some friends from Pakistan that I hadn't seen in so long. They're actually live in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and so they came to Urbana, um, and it was cool just to see them after not seeing them for five years, seeing how their life is, 
um, seeing how they're doing in college and how God is just working through them. Um, and yeah, and also um, the place where I felt the most growth is during the seminars that they had there at Urbana. They have seminars, hundreds of them, about um, like mi being a missionary, about uh, evangelism, about all sorts of things, uh, topics. And um, I went to a lot of uh, seminars about evangelism, and I realized that um, everyone is called to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a missionary like my parents or my family, or you don't have to be like a pastor like Kurt. Like everyone can be evangelists um, where they are in their own lives. And for me specifically, that um, stuck out to me because there's a lot of people at my college, De Anza College, just local here, that a lot of friends that aren't, aren't believers, and it just encouraged me to reach out to them and um, share about uh, God's love for them and um, just how much um, a relationship with Jesus um, means to them. And, yeah. So it was a really uh, powerful experience at Urbana. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Hold up, I gotta pull up the notes. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Helena, and I'm one of the college students here. Um, yeah, I just want to take the time to thank Valley and all of you who supported us because it wouldn't have been possible without you guys. Um, but yeah, I wasn't completely sure if I was gonna go to Urbana, but it was really cool just seeing how God um, was faithful through the whole thing and just um, yeah made everything work out. So, nearing the end of 2018, I had felt a strong calling to missions and wasn't really sure where to go from there. Um, I had heard of Urbana, and I knew God wanted me uh, to go there, so I wasn't really sure, like, how it was going to happen or how I was going to pay for who I was even going to go with, but, yeah, he worked out all the details. So, we spent seven days surrounded by, I think, 16,000 college students, and it was just really cool to see, like, how on fire they were for... Um, to pursue their um, their purpose and yeah it, it was God's presence was just super evident um, yeah during the week of diving into scripture listening to speakers and sharing life with fellow believers I had experienced such a profound and sudden burst of clarity uh, as I, as we read through Revelation I came to see why it was called Revelation um, just within five days uh, God had revealed to me more than He had in um, the 19 years of my life. Uh, hmm. God was able to show me not the potential I possess, but um, the ways God could potentially use me. Just realizing my life was no longer mine, but willingly giving it to God, eager to see the ways that he could use me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm no longer anxious or afraid of what the future holds, but excited to see the limits that God's going to push me. Looking forward towards the future, if your dreams are something that you can achieve, I think you're dreaming too small. Amen. <laughs> I think I want to urge all of us to dream, not with our strength in mind, but with God's strength in mind. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick one thing that I took away from Urbana was just realizing that God's the only thing that matters. Um, I strongly felt the Holy Spirit pushing me into missions and just the possibility of maybe becoming a teacher overseas. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, everyone is called to be faithful witnesses, no matter where you are, how old you are, or um, yeah, whatever you're going through. God has a plan for you and a purpose to fulfill. So my prayer for all of us is to be bold in our faith, proclaiming the good news as if Jesus were coming tomorrow. Right. right. Thank you so much. Wow. How exciting, right? These are young Timothys. Uh, we're going to look today in Philippians chapter 2 about this guy, Timothy, young, afraid, unsure about the, certain, uh, the certainty of the future, and yet God did amazing things through, through him. And uh, thanks, you guys, for stepping out on faith there. Philippians chapter 2, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 19. Okay, so here we go. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I too may be cheered by news of you. Now, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you've been uh, working our way through chapter two and, and this 
amazing, mind-blowing uh, doxology at the end of verses 9 through 11. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. If you were here last Sunday, you saw this amazing exhortation. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you, right? I mean, just kind of like earth-shattering kind of, of uh, uh, exhortation. I walked out last Sunday with my mind just spinning, like, oh, Lord, you know, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And then we come to verse 19, and he's talking about travel plans. Like, you know, and this guy, Timothy, it's kind of, I mean, honestly, I'm like, I get this passage, Glenn gets to preach on, you know, this awesome stuff. I'm like, what's up with that? And I said, okay, God, like, why, why this, why this here? And, and then it dawned on me that what Paul is doing is he's giving us a concrete example of exactly what he's been talking about in the previous chapters. Timothy, Epaphroditus. Start the list of servants of God who have laid their self-interest aside. Who've taken up the same attitude that Jesus has. Who are striving, chapter 1, verse 27, side by side with one mind for the gospel. It's dusty feet of regular guys who just want to live for Jesus. And he starts out, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send him to you soon. And, and so I started thinking a little bit about, okay, well, how does that then play into where he's been and where he's going? And, and um, I found this, this way of communicating to you just very quickly. Uh, can we do this, guys? The video? All right. So just quick. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> There's actually three more verses, right? I mean, because, you know, three more journeys. Uh, uh, homeschooler, I think, too much time on his hands, something like that. Uh, yeah, right? Pretty good. You can check it out on YouTube. It's good stuff. Um, all right, so, so again, I, I have to admit, I'm making a confession right here. I love maps. I love geography. I kind of geek out on this. So I ran this past Daniel and he said, okay, the song maybe. <laughs> All right. But again, first missionary journey, right? Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas called out from the church, sent, go. And so they go up. Now, the key city to notice there is Lystra or Lystra. I don't know quite how to say it. But right, that's Timothy's hometown. And so, right, they, they, they present the gospel there, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, somebody gets healed miraculously. They think they're gods. Paul ends up getting stoned. Okay, not the best outcome. Left for dead. But the seeds of the gospel get planted there. Now, on his second missionary journey, again, uh, Barnabas and uh, John Mark go, go south. He goes north with Silas. And again, they go through Lystra. This time, there's young Timothy there. And they pick him up. I mean, he's one of those guys, he's sitting in the front row, he's got his Bible out, he's got notes, he's going, yeah, Paul, come on, give me more, give me more. And he's like, you, you need to come with me, Ticey. You need to come with me. We're going, all right, let's go. And he says, mom's going, uh, what? Did you ask your mother about that? <laughs> right? And grandmother, Eunice, right? So th they became Christians somewhere along the way, but, but now here's, and he goes with them. Now notice again, where do they end up? Philippi. So Timothy was there with Paul all the way through this journey and as the church got planted and the jail got broken and all those amazing miracles happened in Philippi, Timothy was there with them. Third missionary journey, again, back to see the same, back to make sure everybody was doing fine. And as you look at this map and you see some of these cities, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth. You go, hmm, where have I heard those names before? Those are books of the Bible, right? Why? Because Paul had to write letters to those guys. He had to send word, send instruction, help them figure out how to walk with Jesus, right? 
So then again, Paul's fourth missionary journey, <laughs> if you want to call it that, right? He's hanging out with Herod in Caesarea, in jail, getting nowhere, two years, wasting time there. So he appeals to Rome, Acts chapter 16. And, and so he says, well, to Rome you shall go, right? Harrowing journey to get there. But now he's sitting there in Rome, in jail. The book of Acts ends with this. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. Awesome, right? And again, this is where we see the book of Colossians written, the book of Philippians written. Um, we see Colossians and Ephesians, all these letters out to the church, which we now have today and can kind of go, okay, I get it. I, I, I can figure out how to walk with the Lord. Again, now why is this important? Because uh, these lofty and glorious truths that we have been challenged by Paul on now come down to living examples in these, in these guys. Um, in fact, if you wanted to look at chapter 2 as really four examples, the examples of Christ, the examples of Paul. What, remember Paul last week? I'm being poured out as a drink offering. My life is being poured away. Here's Paul in jail. Not sure today, you know, Caesar, I may decide to kill you today. Or, oh, Paul, I may decide to let you go. Paul says, well, whatever. To live as Christ, to die as gain. I'm good with either one, right? Now, he wanted to get out. We'll see that in our text today. But, uh, but again, this is just living, breathing realities, these servants. And, and so here's the question. What does it take to be a servant of God? Consider the troubling statistics about pastors today in evangelical churches compiled by the Barna, focused on the family, Fuller Seminary. 71% of pastors state that they are burned out and battle depression beyond fatigue on a weekly or even daily basis. 35 to 40% of pastors leave the ministry within the first five years. In America, 15,000 pastors leave the ministry permanently each month. 15,000 a month. 80% of pastors and 85% of their spouses feel discouraged in their roles. 50% of pastors' wives feel that their husband entering the ministry was the most destructive thing ever to happen to their families. Only one out of 10 ministers will actually retire a minister. The average clergy stay is less than five years at a church. Less than five years. And so Paul can say, yeah, I'm being poured out. But what that means is there was something that kept him going. And what we're going to see in Timothy and Epaphroditus is, is these rock-solid character foundations that keep you going. And, and I just wanted to share that Valley, you know, we're just a little unique. For instance, you know, the average size church in America is under 100. Worldwide, even smaller. So again, we're just... A little, a little different in that way. Many of our staff uh, here are part-time. In fact, one half, Southern Baptists say that one half of all their pastors are bivocational. So as you look over this list of, of our pastoral staff and ministry staff that have been here for more than 10 years, many of them are bivocational. But May 1st, I'm sorry, um, yeah, May 1st, will be Glenn Miller's 21st anniversary at Valley Church. Um, Dave Carlson, our friend down at our, our daughter church uh, in Neighborhood Bible, 21 years in September. Jamie Burnett, who has been serving uh, as our um, uh, HR and business manager for many years, 19 years. Uh, March 1st was 18 for me. Ben Palm, again, at Neighborhood Bible Church. Marsha, 15 years. Matt McLaughlin, again, 43 years at City Team, but also working aside along with us for 15 years. Uh, Thomas Sorrentino, 13 years. Daniel Kim, 11 years. Jesus Rubiclava, uh, 10 years. And uh, Linda Mack, 10 years. And then a, a whole host of others. And again, these are just the professionals, but and then we have hundreds of volunteers, some who have been here even longer. And I have to say, there's actually one servant who even has been here longer than Glenn. Cindy Scott. Cindy, are you here? Cindy, 34 years here at Valley. 
Cindy has the heart of a servant. She loves the Lord and loves the people and loves you. It's a privilege to, to be with us. Uh, one grim statistic with youth pastors is the general consensus, the average tenure of a youth minister is not more than 18 months. And yet Craig Stevens, five years, August 1st. Clayton Edelman, two years, June 18th. So again, what keeps these guys going? Now, yeah, we've had people that have joined our team and moved on and things have happened like that. But what does it take? What does it take to be a faithful servant for the Lord? And what qualities should we look for? All right, so let's dive into Timothy, right? Paul and Barnabas, they picked him up along the way. They came, Acts chapter 16 says this, they found Timothy, notice he was well spoken of by the brothers. He already had a reputation. He was young, he was maybe kind of dumb, but what he had, he was a reputation of being dedicated, of being eager, of being on top of things. So he was getting after it. And notice too, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because his, uh, the Jews knew in those places that his father was a Greek. So again, a mixed cultural uh, heritage, a mixed cultural background. We know that his mother and grandmother were faithful. They had been converted probably in Paul's missionary journey. We know that Timothy had been exposed to the Jewish scriptures. I can just see Eunice and Lois there with Timothy on the knee saying, okay, you know, this is what the scripture's saying, going over the Psalms and this kind of thing. But it wasn't all easy for Timothy, right? Timothy may, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, been subject to frequent ailments, right? Uh, weak stomach. Paul encourages to use a little wine for your stomach's sake. 1 Corinthians 16.10 says that when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease, right? We, we get the idea he's maybe a little uh, um, timid. 1 Timothy 4.12, look, no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in faith, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, right? Not to be afraid. So Timothy's, Timothy's kind of natural approach to things was, was timidity. There was something to get over there. He was affectionate but fearful. He needed some personal admonitions from his father in the faith. Read through 2 Timothy. You can just see this young guy. Youthful lust. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. So you go, wow, Timothy, you had a lot to overcome, right? But no other companion of Paul's had been entrusted with such amazing responsibilities. His name appears along with Paul on 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, the Thessalonians, Philemon. Two letters get addressed excuse me, uh, to him. And Paul sent them on these missions to the Thessalonians. Tradition has it that he ended up as the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Tradition has it that he spent time in jail. And again, tradition has it that he died in 97, murdered by a crowd of pagans that he told them that their celebration of the idol, idols was ridiculous. This guy lived it to the end, faithful. And so when Timothy, when Paul is in prison, he's awaiting execution or release. I don't know what's going to happen. Who does he call for? He wants Timothy there with him. Look at verse 19. He wants to send him to him soon. And just as a side note, that he knows that I too may be cheered by news of you. Now remember, this is pre-cell phone, pre-internet, pre-texting. I know that's hard to conceive of a world like that, right? But the only way you got messages was somebody hand-carried a letter, right? So he was saying, I want to send Timothy to you, and I want him to come back and to let me know how you're doing. And again, his positive outcome that I'm anticipating ahead of time that you're going to do what I'm telling you to do. And what had he been telling him to do? Stop grumbling. Stop being disunified. Stop being petty and selfish and conceited. Get over yourself, right, is basically what he's saying. And he says, I know that when Timothy comes back, he's going to tell me you're doing good. He's going to tell me that Yodia and Syntyche, who'd been having their best buds now, right? That there's this healing that's happening. That's just Paul's way. Now, with other churches, uh, he was a little more strong. But remember, he's drawing the Philippians along. Look at verse 23. He says, I hope to send him just as soon as I see how it goes with me. 
Uh, you know, if I get executed, I may not send Timothy. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I trust the Lord that I will get to come to. There's his heart, right? And again, he wants that information going back and forth. All right, let's look at five qualities of a faithful servant that we're going to see here in Timothy. Start in verse 20. For I have no one else like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. It's literally, I have no one so like-souled. Notice verse, go back and look at 127. You know where it says, with one mind. Remember we translated that as one soul. It goes beyond just mental assent. There is no one with me, blood, sweat, and tears. There's no one that's got that same deep-rooted, I will give it up for my friends. No, Timothy consistently shared Paul's outlook and specifically his deep care and concern. But who else is he talking about here? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I read this and I said, oh, if, if I was like Epaphroditus and I was sitting there and says, I have no one else like my man Timothy, <laughs> I'd be going, well, what about me? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and that's not Paul's intent here. He's not saying that Epaphrodites or any of those at the end of the book, he says, all who are with me greet you, right? He's saying that Timothy just stood out. He excelled. He was way more than the others in carrying that deep concern, that deep love for the Philippians. Let me tell you, friends, if you have a desire to serve God, you've got to have a deep love for people, a deep care for others. A, a desire and the willingness to put yourself out there to help others. That doesn't mean you have to be the life of the party or stand up in front. You can do that in a thousand different ways, but you've got to be people-oriented. Secondly, look at these motives, verse 21. For they all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. Now, who is he talking about there? If you remember back in chapter one, Paul is talking about various people that are with him, right? He's in jail, Caesar's household, a praetorian guard. He says, most of the brothers have become more bold, more bold, but still not bold, right? And so they're moving toward that, still have self-interest, self-protection in mind. Not like Timothy. Timothy's out there. Timothy's putting it out there. In fact, even in verse 17, he talks about those who proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. What, what can I get out of this gospel? Friends, there are, out there, there are people out there today that are using the name of Jesus to get rich, to get notoriety, to, to pad their own pockets and their own reputation, their own power. You know, that's not, that's not the way Timothy was. He's out there. He's wanting to serve in self-sacrificial ways. I've talked to some people who say, oh, I want to serve the Lord in Hawaii, <laughs> on the beach, <laughs> in a big church with lots of people giving tithes, right? And I say, have you set aside self-interest for the gospel, right? Now, now again, uh, uh, nothing against any of you who have relatives who serve the Lord in Hawaii, uh, I'm listening for that call uh, myself. Yeah, right. But if that's the heart, if that's the, what am I going to get out of this? My friends, our focus is in the wrong place. Where should it be? Well, look at this. For they all seek their own interests, but not those of Christ. What, was, what were Christ's interests? Was Christ trying to make a name for himself? Was he trying to win friends and influence people? Was he trying to, you know, make a big noise for himself? Get rich, get powerful, get known, get published. No, the exact opposite. Think about it. Jesus died a disgraced criminal with no worldly possessions. What was his concern? I have come to do the Father's will. I have come to do what he has told me to do. Those were Jesus' concerns. That was his primary mission. But then look at the fourth element, proven under pressure. Verse 22, but you know of Timothy's proven worth. The word there has to do with what's translated in Romans 5 as character. He's not just a flash in the pan. He didn't come and leave when the going got tough. In contrast to most of the other believers, 
Timothy had demonstrated his worthiness as a servant of God for more than 10 years. He'd worked hard beside them, through thick, through thin, through good days, through bad days, in plenty and in want. Timothy had been there right beside him, suffering many of those ways. One of the qualifications that we have for a deacon or an elder or pastor here is that they are proven. We just don't put somebody in who, who come and has a lot of desire, even a lot of gift, even a lot of talent, even you know, other resources know it is their approvedness. I remember I was standing up against a wall in a room about this size. I'd been a new Christian and I was standing there and I was you know, kind of holding the wall up, a little bit of a wallflower. And somebody come and said, hey, Jones, we got 400 chairs that need to be put up here. How about it? And I was like, uh, me? <laughs> okay, that was my start in ministry. Jesus said, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. Servants of God will be faithful in little things. Because there's really, one of our, one of our young Timothys here said it, there's no little thing in the kingdom of God. You're touching lives. My very next ministry was to disciple a junior higher. Right? Now this kid knew more Bible knew more about God, knew more theology, way more than I did. I was just struggling to keep up with it, but I was discipling him, right? I was just a little older than him. I mean, I was like, okay, Lord, well, what's in front of me? What, what's in front of you, friend? What do you got in your hands? What abilities, what talents, what opportunities do you have to serve God? Are you being faithful? Are you being uh, proving your character? All right, notice uh, notice the next thing there. Uh, he says, uh, as a son, he served me with the gospel. As a son with a father, he has served me with the gospel. Oh, what a, what a beautiful picture, right? It's a picture of, of, uh, of gratitude, a picture of honor. It's a picture of wanting that depth of relationship, not just checking off boxes for obedience, but a, a real desire to follow to serve him. As a father, he has served with me. Notice even Paul's mindset. It doesn't say, as a son, uh, he has served me. He says he has served with me. Come along with me, right? Isn't that beautiful? Paul had all the authority. Paul had all the clout that he needed to kind of say, Timothy, snap to. No, he's like, come along with me. That's Timothy's mindset. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul saying to Timothy, he says, you have, however, have followed my teaching. You've been obedient. You've been submissive. You followed the, the guidance before you. You followed my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast, my persecutions. You're, stand, you're following in my steps, Timothy. Way to go. Let me tell you what, friends, a servant will never be an authority if they haven't been under authority. You cannot lead if you don't know how to follow. And so being a part of that kind of a mindset where we humble ourselves, 1 Peter 5, 6, under the mighty hand of God, what? That he may exalt you in due time. It starts with humbling, with following, with submitting. To who? To God first. We submit to ourselves to one another. It's Ephesians chapter 5. We submit ourselves to governing authorities. We submit ourselves to our leaders. And when that happens, then we are useful to God. Now, notice these. These five points. There's not one that's there about and has a beautiful voice. Although a beautiful voice is nice. The one who can play the guitar or can preach or, 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 or uh, has a gift of mercy. There's nothing about gifts. There's nothing about abilities. It's all character. You see that? It's all about Jesus at work in the depths of our hearts. And that then flows to the outside. That's why Paul says, have this attitude. Because out of attitude will flow action, will flow life, will flow character. All right, we got to get to good old Epaphrodites. Uh, look at verse 25. I thought it necessary to send you Epaphrodites, my brother. Again, more travel plans, right? 
And f- but notice these five elements. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and messenger and minister. I don't have time to go through all of those in depth today, but just notice each one of those has a level of teamwork. It reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 2. He talks about a soldier. He talks about an athlete. He talks about a farmer. All of those require discipline and commitment and team. Epaphrodites had a shared Savior as Christ. He calls him my brother. My brother. My, my blood brother in Christ. That's the first and most important common role we share. Secondly, it's my my fellow laborer. I'm in the plow. I'm in the, I'm in the trenches. I'm, I'm in him, with him, with her, laboring side by side. Epaphroditus shared risk. You'll notice the rest of the verses in verse 30 talk about Epaphroditus. He was, he was out there. He was risking his health. And, and we don't know exactly how that happened, right? Did he get sick along the way, drank some water he shouldn't have drunk, you know, uh, ate something he shouldn't have eaten? Uh, eaten uh, in one of these places, or, or if he just, just fried himself. See, see, Epaphroditus came from the church in Philippi with a gift, right? He had brought that along with them. They'd made this collection, and they just hadn't had the opportunity to give it to him. So Epaphroditus starts walking, gets on a boat, does whatever it takes to get there, and is probably sick when he comes, and was quite concerned because the Philippian church heard about that and said, what's happening to Epaphrodites? He says, no, he's all right. He's okay. I'm going to send him back to you. He shared that risk. You know, that's what soldiers do, right? They step in to harm's way to protect others, to do what it takes to get them to where they need to be. That's what they do. And that's what Paul had done. Shipwrecked, sick, robbed, beaten, you know, Paul's list of litany and the scars on his body were clear, and Epaphroditus was that same kind of guy. And then it says a shared message. <clears throat> the word that he uses there is apostolos, apostle. He's an apostle. Now, not like Paul and not like the other disciples, but he was a messenger. He came with that message of the gospel, with the message of good news. And then finally it says he was a shared minister. He was a minister. He brought this gift, this offering from the Philippian church to, to love on the uh, 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 Paul. So how do we apply this now? Now, the, the very last thing that, that, that Paul would want us to say, like, wow, Timothy, wow, Epaphrodites, I could never be like them. That they're amazing. The very last thing would be to have them be points of admiration, but not inspiration. So so the question is not, wow, you know, uh, um, what do I need to follow and to be exactly like Timothy? It's how do you need to follow in Christ's footsteps in your unique sphere? What does it look like with your opportunities, with your gifts? How can you be more like Christ in your own unique way? The temptation we have to follow personalities instead of Christ is strong in the church today and motivates a lot of people the wrong way. You think about it. You can follow your favorite Christian celebrity on YouTube, on podcasts, buy their t-shirt, and even go on a cruise with them to Alaska. When we put personalities in front of Christ, we get it in the wrong order. People can inspire us. They can encourage us. And we should keep that in mind. Bonhoeffer said this, every personality cult that is concerned with important qualities, abilities, strengths, and talents of someone else, even though they may be thoroughly spiritual in nature, is worldly and has no place in Christian community. It's not about personalities. It's not even about talents. It's about proven character and dedication for the Lord. I want to close today again by asking you this question, these uh, couple questions. Are you putting others first? In little ways, in little places, starting in your home, starting with that group of friends around you, or putting others first? 
Secondly, are you being faithful with what's put in front of you? Are you saying yes when possible to things that'll have an eternal impact? And then finally, are you willing to take a risk? My father-in-law uh, used to end his weekly blog with his take care. But now he's changed it. He says, take a risk. Not foolish, okay? I'm not talking crazy. Uh, I'm talking about stepping out of your comfort zone for Jesus' sake. I want to invite you to stand with me. Every one of us is commissioned to be a servant. Amen? Helena said it. All of us can do it. Daniel said it. All of us can be evangelists. All of us can share wherever we want to share. Are you, are you willing to say, Lord, I'm willing to put others first today? I'm, I'm willing to be faithful with what's in front of me. And if, I, and if there isn't anything, I'm willing to take a risk to find something. If you're, if you're willing to say that today, would you just raise your hand before the Lord? Okay, go ahead and put your hands down. If you feel like God is calling you to serve the Lord vocationally, that is, you feel like God is calling you to say, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go where you send me. I'm going to eat what you feed me. I'm going to uh, live where you've told me to live in a vocational way, maybe bivocationally. Would you raise your hand? Lord, I'm here. I'm ready to, I'm ready to serve you. I don't know what it looks like. I don't have all the details, but I'm ready to serve you. Would you just raise your hand? Okay, you can put your hands down. Today, I'm, I'm going to ask those of you who raise your hand if you'd like to have prayer. We, we'd love to pray for you today. I want you to come up here to, to your left and just, just to have folks from our prayer team lay hands on you, encourage you, bless you, uh, and we'll do that uh, at the end of the service. Um, and so. Uh, let's all pray together here now. God, we've raised our hands to you and asked you to fill them, to give us opportunities to step out, to take a risk, to be faithful. God, I pray right now for each of us in this room that we would know and sense and feel your guidance and direction and power. Whether it's back to the office tomorrow or back home or back to school, whatever it is, Lord, that you would lead and guide. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. Um, if at the end of the service you'd like to come up and be prayed for again, prayer team, uh, would you come, pastors and uh, elders and spouses, if you'd come up, we'd just like to have a time of prayer here in the front. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. How should we close our service, Daniel? All right, I just prayed, so why don't we do this? Why don't you stand back up again? <laughs> Greet the servants of God around you, and uh, have an awesome day. God bless you, all right? Come on up and pray if you want prayer for it.